Second Peter chapter one is where we're going to start today. As you know, we just finished First Peter, and now it's my intention that we're going to go through Second Peter as well. Second Peter is a short book. It seems like it was written sometime after First Peter, not like you know sometime, but a good amount of time after First Peter, probably a decade or more. And in fact, as I was as I was studying Second Peter, getting ready to to preach this series of sermons, I came across the the critical scholarship on Second Peter. And if you're not familiar with critical scholars, there are these groups of People, sometimes they call themselves Christians, usually they don't, and their whole intention is to discredit Scripture. And so this group of scholars has concluded that Second Peter was definitely not written by Peter. Um, and I disagree with that for a number of reasons. But the main one is this. Before we get into any of all of that, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I want to say something about it, because I do think you may encounter this As you go, as you study, if you pick up different commentaries, things like that, trying to get deeper into the Word, you may find sometimes these critical scholars say, well, whoever claims to have written the book didn't really. And what they say about 2 Peter is that it's so stylistically different from 1 Peter, that the words are different, that some of the phrasing is different, that they say, well, surely Peter couldn't have written this book. But the reality is we only have two very short books from Peter. And I think as you'll, as you'll find, what you'll find as we go through Second Peter is exactly what I've found, that those words are different because he's talking about different things. He's moving from a different perspective, and he's looking at a different set of ideas, and he's looking at a different perspective looking forward into the future. This was probably near the end of his life that he wrote this, because what he gives us in Second Peter is this summary of the faith. Whereas First Peter, his intention was very clearly to encourage a church being persecuted in a, in a world that hated them. Now he's encouraging a church that is looking into the future as he's getting ready to die, to leave the world as the apostles are starting to age and be martyred. He's encouraging them, hey, this faith is still just as sturdy as it was when I wrote to you back then. And even if the style is different, and even if it's hugely different, and we say, well, I can see what they're saying, We've got to recognize that they're starting from a position that the Bible isn't true, that all of its claims are false, that they are pious lies, so to speak. And so, of course, their perspective is now the Bible needs to prove itself to be exactly what it says it is. Whereas our perspective, and I think the fair one, is to start with what the Bible says about itself, that it is the Word of God, that it is special, that they are telling the truth as, the, as best as they can, as they've been carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so what I think the fair position is, if they're going to discredit books of the Bible, they need to come with heavy, heavy proof. And they don't have it. They just don't have it. And so rather than spend a whole sermon today talking about why we should believe Peter wrote 2 Peter, which I was thinking about doing, let me just say that the evidence that they have is so small and so shallow, and it has to do with style It has to do with what they think possibly the genre might have been. That they don't have any solid evidence that Peter didn't write it. In fact, what we have is 1 Peter 1, or excuse me, 2 Peter 1 1, that begins Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And so, with that said, let me pray for us. We'll read this text today, and I want to get into what it teaches us, what Peter is teaching us from this text. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us the Bible. We thank you that it is a sure and trustworthy guide. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen our faith in the words of Scripture, but not just the words of Scripture, but in you who it teaches us about, that we would have a strengthened faith in Christ, that our hope would be built up and the flames of our faith would be fanned into a greater and greater fire so that we would be unstoppable in this world, that we would be unstoppable for your purposes, but that our love for you would grow, that our vision of you would grow, that our knowledge of you would grow, and as those things grow, that we would have a greater joy and peace, and that you would be glorified in us. 
Lord, we're grateful, again, like I said, that we have this book, that we are not grasping in the darkness trying to figure out who you are, but that you have given us a sure and perfect guide. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're just going to cover the first two verses of 2 Peter today, but I, I, think, I think hopefully you'll see that there's enough there for us to talk about. Um, and I didn't want to skip it, because the temptation is always to just skip these greetings, because they're short, they're sweet. But I think there's so much depth in what he's telling us here that I want us to spend a little bit of time talking about just these first two verses today. So let me read this to you, 2 Peter 1, 1 to 2. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. In fact, it's so short, let me read it a second time. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Christ Jesus, of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He starts, as always, with his name. That's what you did in those days. In fact, we do the same thing. We end with our name, but they would just kind of flip it. And they would start, and I think this is probably a better convention, right? If you're writing a letter, you want to know who wrote it before you read it. And so they would do that. He says, it's me, Simon Peter. But what he says, what interestingly, the way he spells his name is Simeon Peter. Same guy, same name. But this was a culture and a time where they spoke a lot of languages. In fact, there are probably three main languages in Peter's day, especially in the area of Israel. They spoke Aramaic, which was a kind of a more modernized version of Hebrew. That was just their everyday life language. They also spoke Latin. That was the government language because the Romans, were they were ruling. And then they spoke Greek. That was probably more the language of trade and of, of writing. And that was because they were in this Greek world that had overlapped with all of these other things. And so you see all these different layers of culture and of language. And for us, that's kind of crazy, the thought that you might speak three languages fluently. But that's what they had. And so Simon Peter, what he does here, is he uses the Hebrew version of his name, Simeon Peter. And I don't think there's too much significance in that. I just think it's interesting that it adds to me a little bit of extra authenticity. Because if somebody, again, was writing to try to confuse or to try to, to say, hey, look, it's me, Simon Peter, they probably would have just used his, his classical Greek name and not the Hebrew spelling. But he, he does that Hebrew spelling, Simeon Peter. But this is the same Peter who was a disciple of Jesus, who wrote 1 Peter, who walked on the water for a moment with Jesus, if you remember that story. This is the same Peter who denied Christ three times and was forgiven. This is the same one who was filled with the Spirit at Pentecost and spoke in a language that he didn't know. This is the same Peter who is called the Apostle to the Jews by Paul, who was given this amazing ministry and influence. That's the guy who we're hearing from now, who had gone, come a long way from being a Galilean fisherman to now writing a letter that was going to be spread throughout the entire early church. And he describes himself here as a servant and apostle of Christ Jesus. Literally, that word servant is usually translated as a slave. But it's more than just a slave. It's not like somebody who was bought and had no value. That wasn't the idea. The idea is that he was an important, um, valuable servant of the Lord Jesus. Not just a slave, but also that he was an apostle. He was one who had been sent as a representative of his master. And he was able to speak on Christ's behalf and he was able to speak for Christ because he bore Christ's name and his message. And when he says here that I'm a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, it's an appeal to his unique and special authority as an apostle. That what he is saying is not his own ideas, it's the teachings of Jesus. That it, it carries a weight and an authority and it shouldn't be quickly dismissed. As a quick side note here on that word apostle, Remember the apostles were only 13 men. There, there were no more. It was the 12 disciples minus Judas plus Matthias plus Paul. Those were the apostles. 
And when they died, there were no more apostles. And there are no apostles today. That apostle with a capital A, that title of apostle, it was a special group at a special time in history. And those men were physically with Jesus. They witnessed the resurrection. They heard his actual voice. They were trained from the very source, from the word become flesh. And so anyone today who claims to be an apostle in that same sense, they're not. They're not. Because there are no more apostles. That, that age has ended. Those men have died. So that aside, let me just, I just wanted to say that because I hear these guys calling themselves apostles today and I'm thinking, no, you're not. Don't say that. All right. So he goes on to say this. This is where I want us to focus most of our time today. He says, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a lot in that sentence. Well, what I want us to see today is this faith that he's talking about. That there are four truths that he gives us about faith and about our faith and about the faith of the apostles and about the faith of our brothers and sisters in Christ and about the faith that we've inherited throughout the centuries. The first thing is this, number one, every Christian must have faith. Every Christian must have faith. Now, this one is sort of implied in the fact that he's addressing a particular group that he says has has obtained a faith, a group of people who are identified by their faith. That's what we are. Faith is the marker of being a Christian because it is the means by which a person becomes a Christian. Ephesians 2.8, you probably know this hopefully. If not, you're going to hear it several more times today. By grace you have been saved through faith. We have been saved through. Through faith, it is the means by which we become a Christian. And so every Christian must have faith. We have to be so careful that we don't get confused about what makes a person a Christian. Because remember, it's not calling yourself a Christian. It's not acting like a Christian. It's not joining a church. It's not reading the Bible. It's not praying. It's not getting baptized. It is faith. It's just that faith, that trust in Jesus Christ. And faith in the biblical Christian sense is not just agreeing with the things that the Bible says or believing in God or convincing yourself that something untrue is actually true. That's not faith. Biblical faith is trust. It's trust. Trust in the promises of God. And in the case of salvation, it's a trust that when Jesus died on the cross, he carried my sins, died my death, and rose again for my pardon It's a confidence that when I stand before God on the day of judgment, that I will be covered by Jesus. That's Christian faith. And so when I say every Christian must have faith, that's what I mean. That the very heart of what it means to be a Christian is to have faith in Jesus. Okay? Second, faith is the only thing, the only thing that saves us. Faith is the only thing that saves us. That's interesting. He he says that we have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. That you have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Now that could be a reference to two things, right? Who's the ours? What is he talking about? It could either be the apostles. Maybe he's saying you all have obtained a faith of equal standing with the apostles. That's a possibility. That would mean that the faith that we have is just as worthwhile just as valuable in God's sight as that of the apostles. And that's true, absolutely. Or it could be a reference to the Jewish people. Because remember, Peter was a Jew writing to Gentiles. Um, He could be meaning that we as Gentiles, or people who aren't Jewish, outside of God's chosen nation of the Old Testament, who have now been included in full measure in the goodness and grace of God through our faith. right? That we are just just as faithful as the Jews are, right? That there is now no longer a distinction to be made in God's kingdom, but that we are all now sharing in the same faith, in the same Christ, in the same God. And I kind of lean toward this last one because like the, the, we're sharing a faith with the Jewish people. Because if you remember in First Peter, he makes references to Gentiles with Old Testament language over and over again, that language that was used exclusively for Israel. For example, First Peter 2.9 He says to us, who aren't Jews, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so that there, he's making that point about the continuity of faith. And that theme runs throughout the whole New Testament. And so what Peter says here, I think, is that our faith is on equal standing with that of the Jewish people. And I think he's referring to the chosenness and the preciousness of the Jewish people and saying, in essence, now all who believe in Christ are now the people of God in the same sense. But either way, regardless, the point is the same. That faith, the same faith of the apostles, the same faith of the Jews, is now the faith of the Gentiles. And it is the only thing that makes us right before God. That all of us, whether you're a Jew, an apostle, or whatever, you are righteous before God because of your faith and your faith alone. So whether apostle or not, or Jew or Gentile, we're all saved by faith. Again, Romans 1, 16 through 17, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So in other words, no good works can save you, No ceremony can save you. Your race or your nationality sure doesn't save you. Praying the right prayer doesn't save you. None of those things save a person. None of those things make you right with God. It's only faith and faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Again, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So again, it's faith Faith, faith. Faith alone saves a person. All right, here's number three. This one's a little more controversial, but again, I think we see this here, and let me explain. That faith itself is a gift from God. That faith itself is a gift from God. So again, verse one, he says, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Now, a lot is packaged into that word translated obtained. Obtained, I think, is kind of actually a little bit of a weird translation choice because this word means a lot more than what we typically think of the word obtain. The Greek word here is logkano, which in this context means to receive or obtain something by lot or divine will. So it means that we have received or obtained our faith by lot, again, like by the rolling of dice, or by divine will. And in the mindset of the first century where Peter's writing, Rolling dice and the will of God are the same thing because God was the one who determined the roll of the dice. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So the biblical picture of God's divine power and control is so tight that not even a dice roll is outside of God's will. In fact, we have a great example of this in Acts. After Judas had betrayed Jesus, he hung himself in his grief. And so there was an empty seat among the apostles. So in Acts 1, 21 through 26, I'm just going to read this to us. It says, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, he had a lot of names apparently, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And the whole reason I mention that is because of that very last verse, that they cast lots to determine who the replacement for Judas was going to be, and it fell on Matthias, and that was considered to be the divine will of God in that situation. There was no chance involved. It wasn't like they were saying, well, we'll see. Even in rolling the dice, even in casting the lot, God doesn't do chance. Chance isn't real. It's, it's something we've made up as humans. Luck isn't real. God is sovereign over everything. And we know better than to try to explain away the sovereignty of God with luck because we know that God is sovereign over everything and nothing escapes his will. 
so that the, the writer of Proverbs can say, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And so with that in mind, let me say again, Peter uses a word here to describe the receiving of our faith that means we received it by divine will. I mean, let me say before I go any further that we're, we're, interesting, we're entering into a controversial territory, but I think I owe it to you guys to venture into this a little bit because I think I've got a good case. Let me, let me make it a little bit more. I believe that in light of other scriptures that we're about to read, Peter is saying that our faith itself is a gift from God, not something that we can will into being. In Peter's words, it's something that we receive from God because God sovereignly chooses to give that gift to us. And I say that because of two other passages in particular. The first one we've already read twice. I'm going to read it again. is Ephesians 2.8, which says, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And I wish we had the benefit here because sometimes, because the Greek language, every word has a gender, either feminine, masculine, or neuter. And I wish that one of those words, either grace or faith, was a different gender. But they're both feminine words. And so the this is also a feminine word. But I think what he's doing here when he says, and this is not your own doing, he's at least describing one of those. I think he's describing both. By grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Because then he goes on in verse 9 and says, Not of works, lest anyone can boast, should boast. And again, as we said, faith is not a work. Faith is the opposite of a work. It's acknowledging that I cannot work my way to God. And so it would make sense that the whole thing would be a gift from God, grace and the faith. Romans 9, 14 through 18 says this. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. And the context there of Romans 9 is he's talking about salvation. The Apostle Paul is trying to explain why is it that so many of the Jewish people have rejected Christ. And this is what he says, that, well, it's God's mysterious will that we cannot cannot see it all, we don't comprehend it all, but that he has chosen some. He's had mercy on some. And to that, I want to add one other consideration before we move on. And that's the nature of faith. Because faith is trust, trust and belief. That's, that's what faith is. And faith, by virtue of being what it is, I don't think is something that we, that we can decide to have. Because I don't trust my wife as an act of my will. I've seen her and I've known her and I've lived alongside her for a decade and so I trust her. Not because... I decided I was going to have trust in her, right? But because I just do. Now, I I take acts of trust. There are acts of trust that I do. Um, I leave my daughter with her alone because I trust her. Or I let her do things that she promised that she would do because I trust her. Or I let her leave the house because I know that she's going to be faithful to me because I trust her. But those acts of trust are not the trust themselves. They're just the proof of the trust I already have. And I think, again, I could be wrong on this, but I think that faith in Jesus is the same way. That's what it seems like. I can do acts of faith, like obey his word or step out in faith and do something risky, or I can rest my soul on his promises. But at the end of the day, I don't think those those things aren't the faith themselves. We would all say, no, those are works. Obeying God's word, that's a work of faith, but it's not the faith itself because they flow from the faith that I already have. And so I think that's the idea that Peter's pointing us to, that faith itself is a gift from God. Not something I decide to have, but something that is given to me, something that I've been blessed with. All right. Let's move on from that. Number four. So whether you agree with me on that one or not, number four, 
think this one is indisputable. Faith saves us because of the righteousness of Jesus. Faith saves us because of the righteousness of Jesus. That's what he says. We have obtained faith by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we've said in detail for the last two weeks, God owes us nothing. God, God didn't have to save us. And yet in his mercy, he sent Jesus to die in our place so that we might be called righteous even though we are sinners. And without the righteousness of Christ and his atoning death for sin on the cross, there would be no point or object of faith. Right? Faith would just be, I guess, a good thing. But if Jesus hadn't died for us, if we, if we were left without any hope of, to be actually saved, why bother? But now, because of the death of the righteous Christ, we, the unrighteous, get to live by faith. 1 Peter 3.18 speaks of Christ's righteousness. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Because remember, our faith is not what saves us ultimately. It's who we put our faith in that saves us. It's that God saves us through our faith, and it's the righteous one who died for us that saves us. And so Peter says we are saved or we're given that faith because of the righteousness of Jesus, through the righteousness of Jesus. And he is righteous. He is so righteous. Hebrews 4, 15 speaks of his righteousness like this. It says, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So we can't say, well, Jesus had an easy life, right? He never had the chance to sin like we have. No, he, he was confronted with all of it. And I don't think that means every single possible temptation, but every category of temptation, he faced it. Sexual temptation, he faced it. Temptation to greed, he faced it. Temptation to take shortcuts, of course he faced it. Temptation to reject God, he faced that one in the wilderness with the devil, he faced every kind of temptation you can imagine, every category of temptation, and yet he was righteous through all of it, every single bit. And because of that, he was able to rescue us. He was able to stand in our place and to die our death and to rise for us. His great love has redeemed us from the muck of our own sin and offers us hope and eternal life because he is righteous. All right, before we move on from that, I just wanted to say, this is a very interesting way that Peter talks about Jesus. He says, the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think that's a, that's a very important phrase there. Because some translations or some, some groups have wanted to say, Jesus is not the Son of God. Or that he's the Son of God, but not God himself. And yet we know very clearly from John 1 and other places, the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. And the Word was in the beginning with God, and the Word was God. And I think this is just one more clear indicator that Jesus is fully God. Because he says it's the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in case you're curious, the Greek language bears this out because... God and Savior are both referring to Jesus in that God has an article and Savior doesn't. And there's this rule in Greek grammar where if you use two adjectives to describe one person or one thing, you can give one of them the article and leave the other off. And then you know that these pair together to describe this one thing. And so when it says he is the God and Savior, Jesus Christ, he's saying he is God and he is Savior. I just think that's cool. That's just another, if somebody's saying, well, Jesus isn't really God, take him to 2 Peter. Say, look at this. Peter says he's God. All right. As we finish today, I've got one more point I want you to think about with me. And that is this, that with faith comes grace and peace. With faith comes grace and peace. Because we're not just saved we're not just saved in the end. We're, we're being saved right now. That we're, we are rescued from this evil age. 
right now. Even as we live in the world, we are being rescued from the world. And God promises both grace and peace to us. And that's what Peter says in verse 2. He says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Really quickly, grace is good from God that we don't deserve. That's what grace means. It is good things from God that we don't deserve. And really, every good thing we receive from God, we don't deserve. We haven't earned anything from the Lord. He gives because He is good, because He is gracious to us. Romans 8.32 says this, the link between faith and grace on the other side. So the, that salvation is a work of grace, of God's grace, but also we receive all these other things by God's grace. Romans 8.32, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? So that in a sense, Christ, the grace, the gift of Christ, is the guarantee of all the other graces of God for us. Because He's given us the greatest thing. And so Paul says, won't He also give us everything else we need? Every other good gift of grace? But also, we receive peace. Peace with God and peace in our hearts. So Romans 5.1 speaks of the peace with God. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, there's an end to the, the wrath of God for us. Sometimes if we're not careful, we sin and we think, well, God must be mad at me. God must not love me anymore. I messed up. That's got to be it. But that's not how it works. Because we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. We have peace with God that no matter what happens now, well, no matter what we do wrong, no matter how we might sin, if we run back to the forgiveness and the grace of God, we will find it every single time. There is nothing you can do that is too big or too, too evil for God not to forgive. Now, I'm not saying that you go out and, and you take that as a license to do whatever you want. right? Faith in Christ means that we are trusting that our sins have killed us and killed Jesus and now through the sacrifice of Christ and His suffering, we get to live. That should motivate us to not want to do the things that put Jesus on the cross in the first place. And yet, when we fail, if we fail, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. We didn't earn it. We can't undo it. But also, we should have peace in our hearts. We have peace in our hearts. Philippians 4, 6-7. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, when we're trusting in Jesus, when we're really trusting, like I said, faith is trust. When we're saying, you know what? Jesus is all that I need. He will take care of me. He is good. God's promises are always yes in Him. Then we can have peace that no matter what happens, God is still in control. We're still in His hand. Nothing is going to take us out. Nothing is going to ruin us completely. That whatever we face, whatever happens, God is still on our side because of Jesus. Because we have been rescued and redeemed and restored and are held now in the blood of Jesus through faith in Christ, we can be confident that nothing, nothing, nothing is going to take us away from God's plan, is going to destroy God's will in our lives, or is going to ruin us because we are secure in Christ and Christ alone. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your great love for us that you sent your son to die so that we could live. Lord, this morning I ask that you would strengthen our faith. That you would give my brothers and sisters a deeper and deeper knowledge of you. A deeper trust in you. A deeper walk with you. That we would find the grace and peace that are promised us. Lord, help us to go deeper. Help us to love you more. To seek you better. To hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning or anyone who's hearing my voice who, who doesn't know you, 
who is far from you, who is filled with doubt or self-assurance. Lord, I ask today that you would convict them of their sins, that you would open their eyes to see that they are not good, that they are in desperate need, that they will stand before you. And Lord, I ask that you give them the faith to trust in Jesus alone as the only one who can cover their sins and rescue them on that day. Lord, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.